On July 16, 1969, mankind achieved a monumental feat, landing on the moon. This historic event not only marked a triumph for Americans in the space race, but also stood as a remarkable milestone for all of humanity. It served as a defining moment in history, showcasing the remarkable progress of technology. In the Fallout universe, on the very same date, the Virgo 2 lander, known as the Valiant 11, became the very first manned spacecraft to land on the moon. This marked an equally important moment. Following this groundbreaking event, Fallout's United States Space Administration embarked on a series of space missions and projects dedicated to the exploration of the cosmos. Let's talk about them. This is Fallout's Hidden Stories of Space Exploration. Before the historic moon landing, the United States Space Administration actively participated in the 1960s space race, a friendly competition among global superpowers, including the United States, China, and the Soviet Union. It is important to acknowledge that Fallout's lore inherently carries an American bias, given its setting in America. This bias becomes evident as we explore further. Similar to real life, the first forays into the cosmic frontier started with sending animals into space. In real life, the United States sent fruit flies to space in the 1940s, marking the first time living and sentient organisms were sent to space. Conversely, the Soviet Union sent a pair of dogs, Belka and Strelka, into space in the early 1960s. This pair of pups would be the first higher living organism to survive spaceflight. In the Fallout universe, a Persian house cat would be the first space pioneer. A cat named Mr. Pebbles. According to professional astronomer Catherine Swan, it would be Mr. Pebbles who would be the first living organism sent to space. However, it didn't take long for human astronauts to follow suit, marking another significant milestone in the space race. The United States gained a notable advantage when astronaut Captain Carl Bell was credited as the first human in space. Aboard the Defiance 7 space capsule, Bell completed a full orbit around the Earth in a remarkable 12 minutes and 7 seconds. Tragically, Bell lost his life during re-entry on May 5, 1961. While American history celebrates Carl Bell's achievements, both China and the Soviets deny that Bell was the first human in space. While the three major players, America, China, and the Soviet Union, engaged in disputes regarding specific accomplishments and milestones, there was another species altogether that had already mastered spaceflight. Well, at least a few of them did. On his return from a low-orbit manned space mission, Colonel Hardigan and his Clarabella 7 capsule were aiming for a splashdown landing in the ocean. However, fate had something else in store. Mysteriously, the craft would never land. In a swift response, the American government and space administration covered up the incident, claiming that Hardigan had crashed after becoming entangled with high-altitude weather balloons. This official narrative concealed the truth surrounding Hardigan's disappearance, and both the Colonel and Clarabella 7 would vanish without a trace. In reality, it was the Zaytan aliens who intercepted Hardigan and his spacecraft. Hardigan, driven by curiosity and the need to explain his presence in space, attempted to communicate with the extraterrestrial beings. Evidently, these Zaytans weren't really receptive to Hardigan's explanation. An alien captive recording documents Hardigan's failed attempt at diplomacy. This is... this is incredible. I'm... I'm Colonel Hardigan of the United States Air Force. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, what? I, I don't understand. Oh, uh, speaking to this? Yes. I was saying, I'm Colonel Hardigan, United States Air Force. Our nation has been conducting manned space flight tests and... <laughs> I'm sorry, you'll have to forgive me. Frankly, we never expected to meet you all. I'm sure there's a great deal that our two species can learn from- Ow! Ow! 
What the hell? What is this? What are you doing? Yeah. I... <laughs> During Fallout 3's Mothership Zeta DLC, players can stumble upon the deceased Colonel Hardigan, trapped within a cryostasis pod. This chance encounter proves to be remarkably helpful for the Lone Wanderer, as Hardigan's spacesuit becomes a necessary tool for completing a spacewalk. How convenient, eh? Someone from the 1960s inadvertently aids someone from the 2270s. The next documented event in the 1960 space race would actually be its culmination. On July 16, 1969, three astronauts, Captain Richard Wade, Captain Mark Garris, and Captain Michael Hagen, successfully landed the Virgo 2 lunar lander named Valiant 11 on the moon's surface. This would mark the first manned spacecraft to land on the moon and the first humans to walk on a celestial body not named Earth. Later that same year, on November 14, 1969, a Virgo 3 lander, the Valiant 12, would make its way to the moon and leave behind a specially crafted American flag forever marking the United States as the victors of the 1960s space race. Even though the intense competition of the space race had concluded, the United States Space Administration's remarkable accomplishments ensured the agency's continued funding and success for the next half century. It would be 51 years after the moon landing that the USSA would develop their most successful rocket in history, the Delta IX. According to an exhibit at the Museum of Technology in Washington, D.C., the Delta IX rocket was a single-stage vehicle with an ejectable crew section or satellite storage bay. The propulsion system was a nuclear electric derivative drive, using a massive electrical jolt to start the nuclear reaction on launch. To protect the crew section from radiation, a massive titanium vanadium disc was employed. Impressively, the Delta IX spacecraft had the ability to sustain two astronauts for a maximum of 24 days. Suffice to say, the Delta IX was pretty cracked. However, in the unpredictable world of Fallout, where innovative technologies often find alternate applications, the Delta IX met a similar fate. It would be repurposed as a weapon. After completing 77 successful missions, including the final manned flight to the moon in 2052 to recover the flag, the Delta IX was converted for military use. The crew and instrument sections were replaced with a nuclear warhead, perhaps indicating the beginning of the end. In the capital wasteland, remnants of the Delta IX can be discovered in two locations. One is situated at the Museum of Technology, while the other can be found at a crash site near Vernon Square. A remarkable space voyaging vehicle to a weapon of mass destruction, such is the universe of Fallout. Building upon the success of the Delta IX, the United States Space Administration embarked on a subsequent venture called the Delta XI rocket. Although the Delta XI did not achieve the same level of triumph as its predecessor, it played a pivotal role in the establishment of Repcon Aerospace. Following the Delta XI's inaugural launch, Repcon Aerospace was founded with a specific focus on developing alternative fuel sources. A model of the Delta XI can be found displayed in front of the Repcon test site, located in the Mojave. Despite the retirement of the Delta IX and the conclusion of manned lunar missions, the United States Space Administration continued to pursue numerous ongoing projects. Undoubtedly, one of the most remarkable achievements of the USSA was the construction of the Valiant One space station. Drawing inspiration from the rotating wheel space station design conceptualized by aerospace engineer Werner von Braun, the Valiant One featured a central command core housing all the necessary instruments for station control. Circular passageways equipped with airlocks connected the command core to the outer ring, enabling the docking of other spacecraft. Tragically, the outbreak of the Great War left the crew of the Valiant One stranded in space. Over time, due to orbital decay and a lack of proper maintenance, the Valiant One would descend back into Earth's gravitational pull 
crash landing in the Toxic Valley region of Appalachia. With the return of wastelanders to the region, Raider leader Meg Groberg and her group claimed the downed space station as their main base of operations, reinforcing and repurposing it. While many details surrounding the Valiant One remain scarce, it is known that the crew aboard the station were working on some sort of unique device. One of Meg's raiders, Caleb Fisher, discovered surviving documents during his exploration of the space station wreckage. A terminal entry titled Space Beam reads, I'm not sure what sort of work they were doing up on the space station, but I dug into some of the surviving documents. This thing they were building, it's not like anything I've seen before. Is it communications? A weapon? I don't know. There's a lot of missing information. I've decided to call it the Space Beam, for lack of better words. Munch wanted to call it the Angel Piss Project, of course, but I quickly put an end to that. It could be years before I figure it all out, let alone get it running. It seems that the USSA was engaged in the development of an advanced communications device, or, more intriguingly, a weapon. Could this be Fallout's version of the Death Star, perhaps? Well, we can only speculate, as the full extent of their project remains shrouded in mystery. But the Space Beam project wasn't the only post-moon flight project underway. While the United States Space Administration had concluded manned missions to the moon, their ambitions extended beyond Earth's satellite to the red planet, Mars. The Mars Shot project aimed to send a rocket to Mars, with a planned launch scheduled for July 2078. To achieve this ambitious goal, the USSA enlisted the assistance of various contractors, one notable being ArcJet Systems. ArcJet was entrusted with developing two crucial components for the Mars Shot project, a deep range transmitter and an XMB booster engine. The deep range transmitter was a highly advanced radio device designed for interplanetary communications. Although it was functional, several improvements were required before it could be deemed mission ready. The transmitter's current size exceeded the space it was intended to occupy, and its broadcast range fell short by nearly 50% of expectations. These issues would need to be addressed before the Mars Shot Project could progress. But of course, takeoff can't happen without a rocket. ArcJet's second task was to develop the XMB booster engine. This nuclear-powered propulsor began its development in 2075, a few months before the company was awarded the contract. The CEO, Thomas Reinhardt, was a confident fellow. Unfortunately, Reinhardt's confidence would quickly fade. Problem after problem would arise, resulting in near-constant delays. In March 2076, it was reported that the booster engine exceeded the USSA's strict weight guidelines. This setback resulted in an additional seven months being added to the project's timeline. At another stage, a scientist proposed switching from uranium to deuterium, suggesting that this change would improve the burn-to-thrust ratio. While such a modification would enhance the rocket's efficiency, it would also come at a significant cost, both in price and time. Despite these setbacks and challenges faced by the XMB booster project, Thomas Reinhardt decided to unveil his company's progress to the public. This announcement generated significant interest from both the press and the public, as the prospect of sending humans to Mars was considered the most significant event in over a century, following the historic moon landing. However, as the troubled development of the XMB booster would have it, another unfortunate incident occurred. Just one hour before the planned photo op for the XMB booster in February 2077, a reporter managed to breach the facility's security and found themselves positioned underneath the rocket prior to a test fire. Tragically, the reporter was vaporized by the rocket, resulting in a devastating loss of life. Recognizing the potential ramifications this incident could have on ArcJet's funding and its relationship with the United States Space Administration, Reinhardt swiftly orchestrated a cover-up to conceal the tragedy. And as if the problems with the booster were not enough, unrest on the international stage 
would ultimately lead to the indefinite delay of the entire USSA's Mars Shot project. The geopolitical turmoil abroad meant that the plans to send humans to Mars had to be put on hold indefinitely. The dream of reaching the Red Planet would have to wait as the world dealt with its own challenges and uncertainties. But the Mars Shot project wasn't the only failed project by the US Space Administration. In the late 2060s, the USSA, along with several prominent companies including Robco, Arctos Pharma, and those whose names are redacted, initiated a program known as the Deep Sleep Project. Headed by Dr. Emerson Hale, this project aimed to study the effects of human hibernation in space. The plan was simple, rig a spacecraft with a few deep sleep hibernation pods, launch it into space, and have an AI back on Earth, Athena, monitor a volunteer astronaut for 5 or 10 years. Well, it was easier said than done. The hibernation pods, designed and patented by Dr. Carol Bernard in 2067, utilized an energy transfer cycle to suspend the living tissue of the subjects. Sensory data transmission between the hibernating individual and Athena was facilitated through a serum known as Formula K. However, for zero-gravity situations in space, a new serum called Formula Z was developed by Arctos Pharma. So the pods are done, check. Communications between the subjects in the pods and command are done, check. With everything in order, the Deep Sleep project was ready to get underway. With the pods and communication systems in place, the Deep Sleep project was launched by the USSA in 2070. Commander de Guerra, along with Dr. Bernard, Dr. Nowak, and Dr. Lee, were on board the spacecraft. Although the doctors were initially intended to monitor the commander and maintain the ship, they were forced against their will to enter their own hibernation pods. The spacecraft remained silent for years, while data was continuously transmitted between the Athena AI and the sleeping crew. After the successful completion of the first five years, the Deep Sleep project was approved for an additional five years. However, with the outbreak of the Great War in 2077, the astronauts found themselves stranded in orbit, with no one left on Earth to manually terminate the project. Over time, the ship's systems began to fail, causing it to gradually exit its orbit and descend towards Earth. Fortunately for one member of the crew, the head of the project never forgot about it. At some point post-war, Dr. Emerson Hale deployed a guidance beacon, marking a safe landing site for the deep sleep ship to crash into Earth. In 2103, 33 years after the project's initial start in 2070, the spacecraft eventually crash-landed in Appalachia. Commander de Guerra emerged as the sole survivor of the crash. Any relevant data would remain locked behind a security system beyond Athena's control. Besides, as the US government along with its associated agencies were lost in the Great War, there was little use for it anyway. The Deep Sleep Project was no more. The story of pre-war space travel ultimately highlights a series of failures for the United States Space Administration, the agency, once achieving significant milestones in American and human history, faced a series of cover-ups and incomplete projects. The final blow came with the Great War, which not only ended the agency, but also saw the end of humanity's ability to explore the cosmic beyond. As always, thank you for listening. If you liked the video, be sure to share and subscribe. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers.